Did you know that dementia right now, today in the world, is the seventh leading cause of death and more than 55 million people are suffering of this disease? Because dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss, cognitive dysfunction, difficulty solving problems, difficulty to find the words, difficulty on motor abilities, difficulty on social abilities, all of this could be signs in an early condition or a late condition in which you can see that you might have dementia. So what is really dementia? What are the early symptoms of dementia? What are the late symptoms of dementia? What are the risk factors of developing dementia? Are there any habits that I can include on my life so I can prevent dementia on any way? Are there any foods in my diet that I can include so I can work preventing dementia? Or once I have a diagnosis of dementia, is there anything that I can do to make it better? So we need to remember that dementia, it's a group of symptoms that are affecting the memory, thinking and social abilities in a way that the patient is really affected by all of these conditions. It is not an, an, a specific disease, but it's a mix of symptoms that could be related to different diseases. For instance, we are going to see during the video that the causes of dementia might vary between the root cause, but the symptoms, the way it manifests could be the same in two patients, but these two patients, they might manifest the same way, but the root cause or the conditions that they have are completely different. There is something you need to remember. Dementia manifests and involves memory loss, but not everyone that has memory loss has a type of dementia. And right now dementia has caught a lot of attention through people because we've seen on the news and everywhere two great personalities suffering from dementia or then have at least a diagnosis of dementia. The first example is Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis that we know it from the movie Die Hard and other different movies. Yippee -ki -yay, motherfucker. Welcome to the party, pal. Bruce Willis has a specific type of dementia that is called frontotemporal dementia and we're going to talk about it. And also the actor from Thor and in Avengers that it's actor Chris Hemsworth. Chris has a specific type of dementia which is a genetic type and we're going to talk about it. Before we continue please remember to subscribe to the channel and if you really want to help us please hit the like button. I know you haven't seen the video but when you hit the like button YouTube helps us with the algorithm so more people can start finding these videos and once you subscribe Please remember to hit the bell so we can tell you every time that we make new videos for you. So when we're going to look at the symptoms and you want to look at early symptoms or symptoms that are already late, we need to see that we are going to have cognitive changes and psychological changes. Cognitive changes might include memory loss, which is usually noticed by someone else. We're going to see difficulty communicating or finding words. We're going to see difficulty with visual or spatial abilities, like getting somewhere and not knowing where you are, even though you've been there before. You have difficulty with reasoning problems. You have a difficulty with complex tasks. You have a difficulty planning or organizing things. You have a difficulty with coordination or start having motor problems. And you might have confusion or disorientation. And on the psychological changes, you might have personality changes, depression, anxiety, paranoia, agitation, or even hallucinations. But it depends on the area in which you're going to be affected. So now that we know the, the symptoms and that you can start seeing if you or someone in your family or a relative might have dementia. Now let's go and see which are the causes. And when we see the causes, the most common type of dementia, it's Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's, we can put it into two different big groups. Some of the people might have a genetic trait and genetic traits are especially related with a type of gene that codes for a protein that is called ApoE, especially ApoE4. When someone has this specific gene that codes for this protein, patients might have a risk that could be fourfold up to eightfold compared to the rest of the population on developing Alzheimer's disease. But this is just one condition that affects just a group of people and this is something that you might get tested for. If you have Alzheimer's in your family and you want to get tested, ask your physician so you can get the test of ApoE4 
and then you can know if you have a higher risk on developing Alzheimer's. But there is a condition that it's getting more and more people affected by Alzheimer's. And it's when we see on the past years, we've seen the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's and scientists started to notice that it looked pretty much like diabetes. So whenever we started seeing that all the inflammation, all the changes that, that and all the relationship that we saw on the proteins affected by the tau, the tau protein and everything that you might see on the pathophysiology, but the root cause was very related with insulin resistance and with inflammation and with high levels of insulin flowing around the bloodstream. So we know that a cause that it's very important for Alzheimer's, it's the Alzheimer caused by glucotoxicity. And glucotoxicity, it's pretty much the same thing as we're going to end up having like diabetes, obesity, insulin resistance, and all the causes of the metabolic dysfunction that we have today. That's why some people call Alzheimer's today type 3 diabetes. And it's widely accepted all around the world to, to call Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. And at the end of the video, we're going to see what we can do about it. And this is something that for me, it's very good to know. Because if I have a genetic condition, well, I have a higher risk. But most of the people don't have the genetic condition. Most of the people have the other type of Alzheimer's. And let's remember that the majority of the people that have dementia have the type of dementia related to Alzheimer's. Again, this is something that for me, it's very good because you and I can work together so we can do something about it. The second type of dementia, which is the most common, is the microvascular dementia. Microvascular, why? Because when we have high levels of inflammation, of cholesterol, of sugar flowing around our bloodstream, we end up having little clots that go all over our brain. And whenever someone gets a scan of the brain, an MRI or a CT scan of the brain or an angiogram of the, of the brain, we can see that through all of the brain, we see little, little, little spots. What are those spot, spots? Are ischemias or infarctions. What does that mean? The blood was coming and it got clot and this was a part of the brain needing that blood flow. But as it was interrupted, that part of the brain, although it was a little area because there was a high amount of sugar, didn't receive enough blood flow. So that area dies. And we're going to see that only, only in the little microvascular pieces of the brain. So when we see the scan, you see a lot of different spots. When patients develop this kind of dementia, you start seeing that whatever they develop is a wide variety of symptoms because it's not affecting just one part of the brain it's affecting a lot of parts of the brain but in different areas and this is very on a specific but this is very important to know and this one it's also very related to all the metabolic conditions that we suffer today everything related to insulin resistance, being overweighted, obese, prediabetes, diabetes, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypertension, and everything else. So this is related to, to the signs of dementia. What makes it different from Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's needs to have a specific change in some proteins that develop and that they damage their brain tissue, but they are very, very, very similar. And most patients, as I told you at the beginning, you don't have just one condition because it's not a disease. It's a mix of symptoms that can be linked to different conditions. So a patient might have a bit of Alzheimer's because of glucotoxicity and a bit of the vascular dementia, of course. Or may I have a genetic condition that might be leading me to have a higher risk of dementia and I might have a microvascular disease as well? Of course. There is also another cause that I'm, we're not going to go deep, but we just, I just want you to know that it exists. That's called Lewy body dementia. This is a kind of dementia that is caused by the production of a specific kind of proteins that get accumulated in the brain and they start having these symptoms by the part that they affect. But we're not going to go deep in this one. The next one is the frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is 
a specific kind of dementia that affects the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. It could be caused by any of the other conditions that I just mentioned. It's not something specific or that have a different cause. It might be caused by any of the, uh, of the conditions that might lead to dementia. But these patients are going to have speech and language problems. They're going to have problems in the way they make decisions, in their social abilities, in the way they remember things because it's affecting the temporal lobe. So they are going to lose their memory very fast, but they're going to lose all their judgment, their speech, their social connections. It's going to be very, very, very fast. And of course, there is the mixed dementia. And so I told you at the beginning, people might end up having a mix of frontotemporal with Lewy bodies, with a bit of Alzheimer's, with a bit of vascular dementia. And most of the people are going to end up with this. Why? because we don't have just one condition. Most of the patients when they're 80, 90, 70, they have chronic inflammation, they have insulin resistance, they've lost a lot of muscle through the past years, they've gained a lot of fat, they've had a lot of different conditions. So they all trigger to have different kinds of dementia. But there are some conditions that look like dementia that are not dementia that can be reversed and that can be reversed really fast. What? The first one is if you have an infection. If you have an infection, you might have symptoms that relate the, or that look to dementia, but once you treat the infection, the, all the symptoms may go away. If you have hypoglycemia, if you have a vitamin deficiency like the deficiency in vitamin B12, if you have any other nutritional deficiency, like having a deficiency in vitamin B1 or vitamin B6, if you have a side effect of a medication, if you have a brain tumor or if you have a hematoma that can be cured fast. So what are the risk factors when you're advanced in age? Again, right now we used to believe that people have dementia when they were in their 90s, if they're turned at the, at the mid 80s, but now we're seeing patients that are very young with dementia. Why? Because we have chronic conditions, chronic inflammation, and as we're getting kids with infarctions, kids with brain strokes, we're having patients that are young, that are in their 40s, in their 50s, in their 60s, and they're having early signs of dementia because they're accumulating chronic inflammation since they were kids. The second condition is, again, if you have a family or a genetic condition that might lead to have a, a type of dementia, especially Alzheimer's, especially if you have the ApoE4 trait in your bloodstream and this is something that you can get tested. Ask your physician if you have a family history, and this could be very important. Why? Because remember that I mentioned that the microvascular and the other causes are caused by inflammation and the, all the metabolic conditions that can trigger for you to have dementia. Imagine if you have a genetic condition and if you have all the rest. If you have all the rest being taken care of by you, then you might have a genetic condition that can be turned off. That can be just being there. And the risk, it's going to be lower. Although you have a genetic condition that may predispose you, you can be doing something about it. What can we do so we can start doing something about dementia? So this is very important, guys, and please play it and please pay attention. So the first thing is we're going to take care of our diet. And it's very important to take care of our diet and to know what we shouldn't be eating, but not just what we shouldn't be eating, because this is something that people say, oh, if you don't want to get dementia, you have to quit sugar for life. Mm, no, you need to be aware of the amount of sugar that you're eating, because you might get a 100% organic, super well-farmed food and still have cardiovascular disease and get dementia. Why? Because you're not balancing your food well. So what can you do? What you need to do is to go deep in your own nutrition, to include healthy fats, healthy fats coming from avocado, olives, from salmon, from coconut, and include at least 30% of your diet coming from healthy fats. You need to include the right amount of protein. What is a good amount of protein when you go within 1.2 and 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram? Or you might go for one gram of protein per pound. 
and that's the amount of protein that you're going to eat on a day. And when you include the carbs, you shouldn't be afraid of carbs. You should eat a lot of carbs, especially coming from veggies and especially coming from fruits. If you have a metabolic problem already, you might lower the amount of fruits and increase the amount of veggies. And you would say, and what about starches? Well, all depends on if you have a healthy condition or if you have a metabolic condition. If you have a metabolic condition, try to quit starches for a while while you get everything in balance. And once you have everything in balance, you can start enjoying starches once in a while. Starches like what? Like potato, like sweet potato, like corn, like rice. But don't make them in every single meal and make them just a quarter of your plate. But when you include good carbs coming from veggies, you're going to have a lot of glucose control. When you have good amount of fats and good amount of protein, the amount of glucose and the amount of insulin and the amount of all the other inflammation, it's going to be under control. And please remember to eat all your requirements from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. Let your body rest of food and let your body control all the hormones and all the inflammation during 7 p.m. until the next day. Try to move every time you eat. Try to go for a walk maybe 10 or 15 minutes after you eat. Remember to train. Remember to lift weights. When you have more muscle, the relationship between your muscle, your joints, and your brain is going to get better. When you have more muscle, all the relationship with the inflammation and with the hormones that depend on your metabolism and with your circulation are going to get better better and in that way you're taking care of your brain remember to sleep sleep at least six to eight hours get good sleep handle your stress when we are chronically stressed as we live today we are damaging our brains we are damaging our circulation we are getting more levels of cortisol adrenaline and this is going to end up causing more insulin resistance in people that are chronically stressed they can eat well they can train and I've seen tons of patients that they eat well, they train, and they get fat, and they get chronic conditions. Why? Because they have chronic stress. So we really need to see, and we really need to get hands-on on our habits on a scientific way that we eat well, we train well, we sleep well, we manage our stress day by day. We don't need to be horrified or stressed that we need to do it perfectly. No, but just know that taking care of your brain really depends on us. Most of the people that have dementia don't have the genetic condition. Most of the people that have dementia have chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation, including dementia, that is the seventh cause of death. But heart disease and cardiovascular disease, which is the number one cause of death, depends mostly on us. If you're 100 years old, and you die from dementia or from cardiovascular disease, we've done well. 100 years is fine. But people are dying at their 50s because of this, which is not fine. And this is something that we as physicians need to start training patients like you so you can start being the owner of your health. And this is something that we really want to do on this channel. So thanks for seeing the video. If you think that this information is important, please remember to hit the like button, please remember to subscribe and remember to hit the bell so we can tell you every time that we make new videos.